Good morning. Good morning, sir. Mr. Mateer, since you and I had a partial trial run yesterday dealing with uh, the circumstances and the microphone, I've been informed by numerous people that I would back up some time from the microphone and no matter how loud that sounded to me here, some people couldn't hear. So I'm going to stay here. By the same token, I want to make sure that you are allowed to finish your answers and you in turn will try to answer only that one and, and trust that we get to the points of concern. Let me, that you're concerned with. Let me back up a moment. Is one reason that you wanted to make sure that everything you knew about the things as I went along and asked you questions is because this is the first time in three years you've been able to tell your side to the world? Yes, sir. And what's that been like for you in terms of, of frustration? And so as you read and heard the allegations about you and the others and who you supposedly were and who you, what you supposedly did and why, What's that been like? Well, you know, at, I guess at a core... Uh, I'm at, you need to pull the microphone to you now. Okay. Sorry. Is that better? I guess at a core, I mean, I am an advocate. And I think one of the things is I believe in truth. And when you hear people saying things that you know that aren't true, I mean, your tendency is you want to correct that. But I, I was advised that I shouldn't say anything. And so for since the events that we've been discussing the last day. Um, and have, without going into details, excuse me, I, I interrupted you, go ahead. No, I mean, I, I, I finished, I was pausing. All right. And without going into details, have you, been introduced, have you been interviewed over the years by law enforcement about some of these matters? I, well, I have been, yes. Okay. And were you asked by law enforcement, though they couldn't order you, were you asked by law enforcement to not talk publicly about the matters you talked to them? Yes. And have you followed that request? To the best of my ability. That request doesn't apply here today. You understand that? I, I do understand that, sir. All right. I want to go now to some dates, and uh, I'm going to try uh, about a timeline. You know, I, I like you, but not quite the number of years, or quite a number of years more, but like you as a trial lawyer, I've always relied on some type of whiteboard or something that was on the wall, or what? And for those of us who are still technologically challenged, I'm going to try as we go forward here, when we hit dates that are important, I'm going to mention them, and this Ms. Manella is going to try to use uh, the equipment over there to make an entry that it'll be on, on the iPad. And then, at the end of your testimony, I'm going to ask you to glance at a list of dates that we may put up there, and tell us whether those are true and accurate and reflect your testimony about the events and dates that occurred. Are you okay. with me? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I want to apologize to you also uh, in answering these questions that one of the difficulties here is about every, for every exhibit we show and discuss, it takes a little bit of time, correct? And you are you aware that we're on some very strict time requirements here. Yeah, I've read the lieutenant You Governor's lost order. the microphone again. I've, I've read the okay. president's order. All right. If you pull it just a little bit further, right. no, just the top of it. You just move oh, that yes. a little. This way? Yeah, there you go. All right, sorry. Right there. That's good. All right. Now, for instance, we talked about the date of July the 22nd of 2020, in which you had conversations with the attorney general. Do you recall? Yes, I do recall. All right. And the original reason for that meeting was what? Well, the original reason was that the attorney general was going to appear in Travis County District Court on that day. And Darren McCarty, the deputy for civil litigation, had advised me. All right. And so as the meeting started, by the time the meeting started, had you learned that Mr. McCarty, I think you said yesterday, had already talked the attorney general out of it? That is correct. Did you then still take the occasion of that meeting to have several conversations with him? Your Honor, I'm going to object to almost every question is leading, and I'm just going to ask that Mr. Hart not lead this witness. I, I'll be glad not to. Sustained. And I hopefully we'll remember that later. All right. Now, having said, in that particular meeting, what subjects did you want to make sure 
that he understood what your position and concerns were. I, I wanted to have a meeting with the Attorney General to discuss why he was involving himself in the affairs of Nate Paul. Why would he, you know, an Attorney General, want to feel like he had to go to Travis County District Court on behalf of someone? All right. And by the time July 22nd came around of 2020, had you begun, you yourself started to have very much concerns about his relationship with Nate Paul. I, I had that memo reflects that, that I had already raised concerns with, with, with the Attorney General. So this was reiterating concerns that not only that I had, but all the staff, all the senior staff had about being involved with, with Mr. Paul and his, his companies. Can I have uh, Exhibit 87 back up, please, Stella? Now, this is in evidence. It was admitted yesterday. When did you prepare this memo that is dated July the 22nd, 2020? I, I prepared it that day. All right. I'm going to ask you to publish it to the jury. And what I mean by that is I want you to read the relevant portions. I'm going to, first of all, um, the second, first two paragraphs talk about what you have described, do, you, do they not, as the purpose of the initial purpose of the meeting? Correct. And in those two paragraphs, what is your testimony as whether it accurately describes your original concern? It does. I would ask you then to go to the read to the jury out loud the last two paragraphs of this exhibit. Okay. Objection, Your Honor. The document speaks for itself. It's on the screen of every senator here. I'm sure they can read it for themselves. That may be, but I'm irregularly allowed to publish it and have the jury read it. It is published because it's on their screens. That, Overruled. Thank you. Continue. Would you please? Yes, sir. During the course of the meeting, I relayed concerns that I'd previously raised to General Paxton. Now, remember, I'm going to slow you down here for her. Yeah. She's got to get both that, of us. That Yankee comes out in me occasionally. Right. Um, during the Let me start again. During the course of the meeting, I relayed concerns that I had previously raised to General Paxton about his personal involvement in any matters related to Mr. Paul. General Paxton agreed that going forward, he would not have any further personal involvement with any matters that this office is handling that relate to Mr. Paul or his companies and partnerships. Instead, as, in any, as, a, as any other matter, Paren, civil or criminal, close paren, our division attorneys would handle as they deem appropriate with oversight by their division chief and the appropriate deputy. At the time you wrote that memo, had you become or, and had that conversation that you are memorializing, had you become aware that he in the Mitty Foundation case had begun going around the shop supervisor and been dealing and pressuring line prosecutors? Uh, employees. I had. Is that, in fact, one of the things you're referring to in those last sentences of that memo? It is. And what's the problem with that? Well, it, the, the, the problem is the office is being used for the benefit of, of one person. It's not exercising its own independent judgment. You have the attorney general acting on behalf of one person. And by this time, I knew that he was a campaign donor. And so that all, I mean, that, that concerned me because there have been allegations in the past made against the office and against the attorney general that he had taken actions on behalf of campaign donors. So I was super sensitive to that. If in fact, in addition to being to the advantage of a campaign donor, by definition, does that mean it was also to the disadvantage of other citizens? Absolutely. All right, now, after July the 22nd, did you discover whether or not he had kept your, did you, let me back away. How would you, back up, how would you describe his representation to you this meeting in terms of whether you considered it an actual promise or commitment? How would you describe it? I mean, I, I, I believed that he would allow the, the, the professionals, the, 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 the lawyers in the Office of Attorney General, that they would do their jobs. And so I, I believed he would commit. To, I believe that he that he would do that as of July 22nd. I, let's say this. I hoped he would do that. Did you believe that he had given you his word? I, I did. 
<clears throat> and did you believe he would keep it? I, I hoped he would keep it. Did you discover differently after that meeting? I did. Do you recall the first time you became aware he was continuing to pursue activities on behalf of Mr. Nate Paul? Yeah, I, what, what I recall is, I think the first weekend of August, um, I, for the weekend, I rented a house out in East Texas at where I met um, my, my son and, and, and his wife, and, and we took, took the weekend at a lake house. When I returned to the office on Monday, I learned that the office had issued an opinion letter with regard to foreclosures. Now, let me ask you, you were not involved in that process, were you? I was not involved at all and, and, and was not alerted to it until after the fact. At the time that opinion was issued, what had the unrelenting position of the Attorney General's office been to the public and anyone affected that asked for opinions as to the issue of openness during COVID? I, I, I was proud of the office and, and, quite frankly, proud of the Attorney General. We were at the forefront of having Texas reopen and, and to stop COVID restrictions. We did it with regard to churches. We did it with regard to entertainment. So we, we were the ones pushing to open Texas back up. That was, the, that was General Paxton's policy. That was the office's policy. What did you discuss? What was wrong then with this opinion that was it? Oh, wait a minute. You you don't have to lean back. Uh, I, no, I, I won't talk if I'm back here. <laughs> Just bear with me, okay? <laughs> um, what, did you do, what was wrong then with this opinion? The opinion took the complete opposite view. It was as if Anthony Fauci had written it. I mean, it was shut down, you know, that you can't do outside foreclosure sales. I remember coming back and talking to um, Mr. Banger, like, what, what was this? This is completely contrary. All right. So, for those who believed it should have stayed down, shut down, that would have been a good opinion, right? Well, I mean, but again, this is August. This isn't April. I mean, we've been through that. I mean, COVID is March, the shutdown, the 14 days. We've been through that. We had issued opinions with regard to churches that said that, the, you know, that no, no county judge can t shut down a church. No government can shut down a church. We had done that with entertainment. I mean, this, to me, this was in line with all that. And, and my question is based, no matter what side of that issue a member of the public, Senate, or anyone else came down on, are you testifying that to help Nate Paul, Mr. Paxton directed an opinion that was totally contrary to his and the, his administration's policy and his public statements on a regular basis? Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but that is leading absolutely leading. I'll rephrase. I'll rephrase. Sustained. Thank Please you. Re Thank rephrase. You. Put it in your words as to whether, no matter which way one person came down on the issue, what was the import of the seriousness of that opinion? Well, it, it was contrary to what I believed Attorney General Paxson believed and what had been the office of the policy. It was completely contrary. I mean, we were not for shutting things down, certainly not shutting down outside foreclosure sales. All right. Now, when the opinion on foreclosures comes out, uh, at that time, were you aware of any, uh, any benefit it might carry uh, for Mr. Pax, I mean, for uh, Mr. Paul? Yeah, that I do not remember. All right. So was your objection initially the substance of what the opinion was. Uh, my, that was my objection, the substance. And you were unaware one way or the other as to whether, whether it carried a side benefit to Mr. Paul. Not during that week, which I guess was the first full week of August. All right. Then after the August 1st, 2nd, 3rd period of time, when is the next time you became concerned about what Mr. Paxton was doing in terms of positions that might aid a donor, Mr. Nate Paul. Yeah, uh, my wife and I went to Maine um, to visit my daughter who works in Boston. On the first night there, um, and, and we were at a cabin on Mount Desert Island, uh, and sometime during that evening, I got two texts from um, Mrs. Paxton, Senator Paxton, and um, the first one was asking me, and it was objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Let me let me 
let me try it this way. Ask it this way. Did you, do you recall the date? Um, August 14th, 15th. August 14th, 15th. And, and did you get an inquiry from anyone? I did. And for whom was the inquiry from? From Mrs. Paxton. From whom? Mrs. Paxton. Mrs. Paxton. And what was the nature of the inquiry? Again, Your Honor, he's just trying to get around what's clearly hearsay. He wants to talk about what maybe Senator Paxton said to him via text. That's hearsay. Sustained. When you got that particular message from, from her, um, did you become concerned about where the... Again, Your Honor, I'm sorry. Me, let me just finish the question. Did you become concerned about where Mr. Paxton might be? Again, Your Honor, I object to this as hearsay. He's trying in all different ways, but it's still hearsay. Sustain, continue. Uh, Mr. Mateer, uh, later, did you get an inquiry, did you get a response uh, that made you no longer concerned? Yes. Again, Your Honor, I'm, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but this, and the witness knows this too, this is all hearsay. That is not hearsay. I, I'm not asking him for an answer on a matter that trying to prove the truth of the matter asserted outside the courtroom, which of course is what hearsay is. I've asked just simply about his state of mind. Overall, continue. Thank, thank you. You can answer. Yes, I was no longer concerned. And, but do you recall about what time that you got that? that I would, have, I would have seen it the next morning, but in the middle of the night. All right. Now, uh, at, at the, after that date, when's the next time that you became concerned uh, about Mr. Uh, Paxton's dealings with Mr. Paul? I, th I think it then fast forwards to sometime in September. All right. Can you give me an idea? By the way, um, at the time that you were going through, uh, let's take the first week in September. Can you, first week in September, can you describe for the jury what your state of mind and concern was by then uh, in terms of the Attorney General versus Mr. Napal? Well, the, the attorney general had made a promise to me. If you're, uh, I'm sorry. The yeah. attorney general had made a promise to me um, and to other senior staff that he wouldn't have any more dealings with Nate Paul. It, it, it became apparent by September uh, in, in, in light of um, Mrs. Paxton's text, in light of the foreclosure sale, that he, wasn't, he was not honoring that, that, that commitment any longer. Had, by that time, were you having any conversations with Mr. Without going into what, what was said at the time, were you having any conversations with Mr. Pendley about about his concerns over in the criminal justice area? I, yes. Without going into the conversation specifically, what were your concerns? The the, the, the concerns were that Mr. Penley was attempting to follow up. Uh, on a request of Mr. Paul at, at the Attorney General's urging to conduct an investigation with regard to Mr. Paul's allegations that federal and state law enforcement had engaged in improper conduct towards Mr. Paul. Now, we'll, we'll get to the facts of those kinds of circumstances with other witnesses. But as of the time you hit about the first week in September, had you had any... Uh, were you involved in any of the details of investigating Mr. Paul's allegations? No, you yourself? I was not. All right. Your Honor, I, I left my glasses over if I could go get them. Let me ask you if I can go back um, uh, in, to the latter part of August. In August of, uh, of the 2020, did you have occasion to meet a man named Mr. Brandon Kamek? I, I did. And what were the circumstances? What, what, what I recall is I was in my office on the eighth floor 
um, probably with the door closed, probably working on either Google or opioids, and either my assistant, or actually probably the attorney I'm general. I'm gonna, I'm gonna apologize. This is not your fault or anything, but I need to kind of shorten. I'm sorry. It's okay. So did you have occasion to meet him? Where were you when you met him? I was in my office on the eighth floor. All right. And, uh, and how, how is it that you met Mr. Kamek? The, the attorney general brought him by my office. And I hope you understand, sir, going forward. I really apologize when I interrupt you. Uh, under the old days without time limits, I would love to not have to do that, okay? So I'm just apologizing Counselor, to you. Counselor, I, re I remind you that the parties agreed to the time limits, so continue. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I want you to understand I'm not complaining about them. I was just explaining them. <laughs> All right. Now, um, uh, how long did you visit with him? I mean, it must have been 15, 20 minutes. Who brought him into your office? The attorney general, Mr. Parson. Right. And what did you do? Do you recall what you talked to Mr. Kamek about without saying what it was? Do you recall the conversation one way or the other? I mean vaguely recall the conversation. Did you interview him at all? It was not an interview. And did you offer him a job? I did not offer him a job. And at that time, did you have any idea that he was going to later be employed by the attorney general? I did not. Okay. And so after that meeting, um, what was your understanding as to whether Brandon Kamek was going to be ultimately one day an employee of the attorney general's office? I had no expectation of that. All right. Now, um, after that meeting, let's move now into September. Um, I want to, at some time, did you become aware uh, that the Attorney General uh, wanted uh, to hire Mr. Kamek? I, I did become aware of that. How did you become aware? I believe Mr. Penley told me and then sent me a, a memo or right. an email. And did you yourself uh, have a position as to whether Mr. Kamek should be hired? Um, I supported Mr. Penley's position, which he did not support him being hired. And the reason for not hiring Mr. Kamek was what? Well, Mr. Kamek was a five-year lawyer who didn't have any prosecutorial experience. And what was it the Attorney General wanted Mr. Kamek to do? He wanted him to, I guess, assist with or perhaps lead an investigation into uh, the allegations that Mr. Paul was making against federal and state law enforcement. What was the position of your criminal justice division as to whether they wanted Mr. Kamek hired? And I mean sp more specifically, uh, Mr. Penley, uh, what was his position? M M Mr. Penley's position was he did not want Mr. Kamek hired because he felt like he could do the job. And Mr. Maxwell's position? The, the, the same. All right. Uh, had that position been made clear to the attorney general? Yes. Were you aware one way or the other as to whether our attorney general was then contacting other sub-deputy levels uh, to try to get them to agree that Mr. Hammock would be hired? I learned after the fact that that was the case. And what would you tell the jury unanimously was the position of the deputies as to whether Mr. Kamek could be hired to conduct an investigation? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. We're going to hear from Penley and Maxwell. They can tell us their position. Sustained. Let me ask you this. Um, did you yourself ever have conversations with the Attorney General expressing your opposition to Mr. Kamek being hired? Several. Do you recall when those conversations were? And that last answer, I think the microphone missed it. There you go. It was several. And do you know when they were and where they were? They would have been in um, September. Uh, and they would have been in various locations. They right. would have been... Oh, go. Where was the first conversation you remember having with Mr. with Mr. Paxton expressing your opposition to Mr. Kamek being hired? I don't know if it was the first one, but the first one that I, I... Sitting here right now that I recall was, I remember I was driving to Houston, actually to the Woodlands for a Federal Society leadership event, and the Attorney General called me uh, he was on an airplane, I was driving, and we had a discussion about Mr. Penley not being for hiring Kamek. And can you give us a date for that conversation? Yes, it was Friday, September 25th. All right. And on Friday, 20. September 25th, you were in your car. Who was with you? My wife. 
and where you informed very quickly in the conversation who was accompanying uh, the Attorney General for this September the 25th conversation? Well, I, I know that, that the Attorney General was in Washington, D.C. With, with Mr. McCarty, the Deputy for Civil Lit, uh, for a, uh, I believe it was a Google meeting, and they were on a plane coming, they were literally on a plane on a, coming back from D.C. What did Mr. Paxton tell you in that phone conversation? Well, he was upset at Mr. Penley uh, because Mr. Penley had expressed that he, he was not in favor of hiring Mr. Kamek, but the Attorney General wanted Mr. Penley to sign the contract. You recall what he said and what tone he said it in? Um, you know, I, in my time, you know, for over four years and, and, and over four and a half years with the Attorney General, I think he only raised his voice to me, and we had a heated discussion to, on two occasions. Th this was the first occasion. He was, he was not happy. And what did you tell him? I, I, I told him I would support Fiction, Mr. Your Honor, Penley. Hearsay. No, this is a response not being offered for the truth of the matter, but as he simply stated this to the Attorney General. Rule. We're not seeking to prove the truth one way or the other. So that I, my argument is it's not hearsay. Overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so the, the Attorney General was upset that Mr. Penley wouldn't sign the, 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 the outside counsel contract for uh, Mr. Kamek. Um, what did he want you to do as it, as it applied to Mr. Penley? Well, I, he wanted me to talk to Mr. Penley and have him sign the contract on, on this conversation. And did, what did you tell him as to whether you would do that or not? I told him I would not do that. And why did you tell him you would not do that? Because I, I was going to back my deputy. I mean, Mark Penley is a 20-plus year uh, law enforcement prosecutor, and he told me he could do the job that, that he was being requested to do. And then, and then uh, uh, how long did you say that conversation lasted? It, it, it couldn't have been that long because he was on an airplane, and I think he was told to get off. And then when, is the next, when was the next uh, conversation that you had with Mr. Paxton again about whether Mr. Kamek should be hired? Now, this was, a, this was in my office on the following Monday, so that would have been the 28th. And on the 28th, uh, when you had this conversation, what, were the, what was said there and how, what were the circumstances? Well, the, the Attorney General came into my office, and actually he came in and he, he didn't raise Kamek or Penley instead, and again, I, I don't have a strong recollection other than it wasn't those issues, so it was probably he was updating me on the Google meeting, for instance. Um, and I said, um, but I understand you've, you've got a problem. One thing that I didn't say. Wait, wait, I, I didn't understand that part. What did you, you said this to him? I said this to the Attorney General. So he didn't raise the issue, and then I, sa I said to him, uh, um, I probably said Ken. Um, Ken, I understand you're upset with me. Be and how did you understand that? Where did that come from? Mr. Penley had met with Mr. Paxton. Now, without going into what they said, let, let's try to do it this way. Were you aware uh, of a meeting that the, Mr. Paxton had with Mr. Penley on Saturday the 26th in McKinney? I, I was aware. And that should have been the two days before you having a conversation with him. Yes. Is that right in your office? Yes. So if we have the sequence of these conversations, on the 25th, did you say that you were driving to Houston and yes. had the conversation with Mr. Paxton on the phone? Yes. All right. And then were you aware, did you inform, without going into what you told him, did you inform Mr. Penley on the 25th after your conversation with Mr. Paxton, of the contact content of the conversation with Mr. Paxton. Yes, again, I did. Your Honor, I, I hate to keep interrupting, but every question is leading this witness. Sustain. Continue. Let me ask you this: After you got through with the phone conversation with Mr. Paxton on the 25th that you've described, did you alert any member of your staff to that conversation? Yes, again, Your Honor leading. If he wanted to ask him, what did you do thereafter? That would not be leading, but he's just basically telling the witness what he wants him to say. Leading. I don't know how that question alerts him to anything. 
other than my question is, did you talk about that conversation with anyone else after you had it? That's my question. That's a different question, and I have no objection to that one. Did you? And the answer is yes. And whom did you talk to? With Mark Penley. And when and where did you have that conversation with Mr. Penley? I was at the meeting, the FedSoc meeting in the Woodlands. It would have been that e the evening, Saturday evening. All right. And as a result of that conversation or anything else, did you become aware that General Paxson had arranged in a meeting with Mr. Penley that was scheduled to happen the next day? Um, Actually, I believe it happened that day. This was after that meeting. You were aware he had one conversation? Yes. And then after Mr. Pendley had the conversation with the Attorney General on the 25th, which followed your earlier plain conversation with Mr. Paxton, did you become aware of a meeting that Mr. Pendley was to have with Mr. Paxton the next day on Saturday the 26th? Your Honor, <laughs> Objection leading. He's suggesting the answer to the question in the question, which is classic leading, and I object to it. Rephrase, please. Thank you. Do you have any knowledge from any source of whether or not on Saturday the 26th... Yeah, Mr. Harden, I took notes. Pardon me? I took some notes. I know that. Maybe that. would help refresh my memory. Um, that, that, that I made. So I, I think I provided those to everyone. I'm going to show you. Uh, I, I can't put them up on the screen. Do we have a separate set of hard copy? And also, can I ask your honor permission from Ms. Bavorka? Is 240 one of those that you agreed to exhibit? No. no. Okay. I, I, Ms. Bavorka, the question has been answered by Stella. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Would you provide a copy, please, uh, to, the, uh, to the president, please? Uh, Stella. Would you give the witness a copy, please? All right. Um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, first of all, to look at these documents real quickly. We're not going to talk about what's in the contents of them. I'm going to ask you to look and, and first of all, authenticate them for me. Are these notes that you yourself prepared? Yes. You keep your voice, the microphone. You're yes. Right. All right. And when you did, when did you prepare these notes? I, I prepared these notes on the Sunday after I resigned. All right. And so this is after you had left. Is that correct? That is correct. By I two? resigned. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I resigned on Friday, the Let, second. Let's talk about oh, the second. All right. And this, these were written on Sunday morning, the fourth. Now, I'm asking you to look and see if these notes truly and, reflect, truly and accurately reflect the events that you were recording as you remembered them on that sunny Sunday over several days. Do they? And do these notes, I want you now to look at what we were talking about. We were on the period of the 25th and the 26th. I don't want you to tell me what your notes say. I want you to read and see if that helps reflect your, your recollection. And then I may ask you some question, but not you reading the notes or anything. I'm going to ask you about your memory. Would you, would you briefly read and review your memory? Yes. Okay, Mr. Harden. All right, does that help refresh your memory? It does, sir. All right, I want to go back to then to your, you put the notes, there. You, you keep them there, but 
testify from what you remember. During your conversations with Mr. Paxton on the 25th, was there any, did you alert him to your feeling, or let me put it another way, was there any contention by Mr. Paxton that you had approved the hiring of Mr. Cameron? Mr. Paxton said that, Mr. Paxton said that to me during that phone conversation. He said what? He, he said, well, you, you, you approved the hiring of Kamek. And I said, absolutely not. And has it been your contention from the very beginning always that you did not approve of the hiring of Mr. Kamek? I never approved the hiring of Mr. Kamek. So was that, how would you describe that part of your conversation with Mr. Paxton when he suggested you had? I think it's probably the first time I ever raised my voice to the Attorney General in response to him raising his voice, voice to me. So we got two raised voices, one on a plane and one in a car. Correct. Who's driving? I was driving, unfortunately. All right. Now, uh, have you had a chance to look at your notes and refresh your memory as to whether or not, when and where, if you did, call Mr. Penley after that call? Yeah. Y yes, I spoke to Mr. Penley twice, once on the 25th, and then I spoke to him again on the 26th. All right. And when you talked to him in the 25th, what is, do you have any memory as to whether or not you learned he was going to meet with Mr. Paxton on the 26th? I, I learned that he was going to meet with Mr. Paxton on the, on the 26th. And well, did you have concerns about that meeting? I, I did because my concern was, my, my concern was that, that General Paxton was going to fire Mr. Penley. So what did you urge Mr. Penley? I, I, I told Mr. Penley, do not hear say. Okay, that's fair enough. That's, I, I, I'll withdraw Sustain. it, Your Honor. I'll, I'll withdraw it, thank you. Um, and during the call, did you and Mr. Paxton have any further conversation concerning why in the world y'all were involved, he was involved with Mr. Paul? During that conversation, and, and then sh just briefly, but certainly on the, the meeting the following Monday. On the 28th. On the 28th. All right. So, but in the call in the airport, I mean, on the airplane, what I call the airplane call, did you express any concern about why y'all were, why he was involved with Mr. Paul? I mean, I, I, re, I, re, I recall um, that I, I again asked him, and this wasn't the first time, but Ken, why are we involved in this? What, what? I mean, it just didn't, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Of all the things going on, why, why, was, why were we involved? What do you in mean this? with all this going on? What are you talking about? Well, by, by this time, this is the end of September. So by this time, we knew about, we knew a lot more about Nate Paul. Um, we had learned a lot more about who he was, the, what was being alleged against him. I mean, he was not a good guy uh, and had a lot of concerns about that. We, we knew about the attorney general uh, wanting to appear in court on behalf of Nate Paul but, but, by, by that time. We, we knew that he, by that time, I knew he had been pressuring uh, the other deputies and actually other line lawyers to do more on behalf of Nate Paul. I mean, so all this was starting by the end of, by the end of September, all this is coming um, to fruition. And of course, this with Penley, Penley just simply saying, I want to investigate it. I've asked him for, I mean, Mark Penley was a loyal person. I mean, he was Mr. Paxton's friends for decades. And during, during one of these, this call, Ken actually says that, that Mark's lying, that Mark Penley's lying. Well, I mean, that to me, and sort of like the, 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 the fact that the Attorney General wanted to appear in court, hearing Mr. Paxton say that Mark Penley, of all people, was lying, I mean, I, I just, I mean, you have to know Mark Penley. Why, why, uh, why, why was that such an aha moment I mean, for you? Hold on. Why was that such an aha moment for you? Because my experience had never been Mark Penley. I mean, he was, he is honest to the fault, just absolutely honest to the fault. And so when General Paxton says that Mark Penley is lying, it just, I mean, 
you know, bells and whistles are going off that this is not good, this is bad. Did you become aware uh, during, after that conversation, do your notes help refresh your memories to whether you knew that Mr. Pendy was then going to meet with the Attorney General on the 26th? I, I did know that. Without going into what Mr. Pendy told you after that meeting, did you have a conversation with Mr. Pendy in which he filled you in on the conversation with, I, with, with Attorney General Paxton? After um, Mr. Penley met with the Attorney General, Mr. Penley called me. All right. Now, then, after that Saturday the 26th, what happened in terms of conversations with Mr. Paxton after the 20, uh, on the morning of the 28th? On the morning of the 28th, I was in my office, and, and the Attorney General came in to, to, to meet with me. What did he want? Um, he, my best recollection is the first part of the conversation was about other cases, probably about Google because he had just been in D.C. He was as friendly as ever. I mean, it was the Ken Paxton that I had known for four plus years. Very friendly, very commutative. Um, and I, I was actually, I mean, I was, I was actually surprised by that because our last discussion had been so heated and then I knew about what had occurred during the weekend. And I, 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 I asked him, because he had told Mr. Penley that he was frustrated with me uh, and compared, compared me to my predecessor, uh, who had been very frustrated at one time. And, and so I brought that up. The, the Attorney General didn't bring it up in that What did you say? I, I said- Objection, you're saying? No, it's with Mr. Paxton. It's, this, this is a conversation between the two. There's really no hearsay here with an admission against the interests of Mr. Paxton that's about to follow. It's a conversation the two of them had. Overruled, go ahead. Go ahead. He, 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 doesn't he didn't address whether he was frustrated with me. Instead, he expressed that he was frustrated with Penley. And what, what was he upset about again? again it, was, it was almost a replay of the conversation that we had on Friday, the Friday before, except this one was... It was not a heated discussion. This was, you know, General Paxton one-on-one, -on -one, just the two of us, and he was, he was what I would say normal Ken Paxton. Um, just, I don't understand. Why, why won't Penley sign this? What did he want you to do? Well, he, during, the, during the conversation, I attempted to explain to him something that I thought he already understood, which is, we have policies and procedures at the Office of Attorney General. We have an executive approval memo process. And I tried to explain to the Attorney General that, you know, that was there, that's, that process is to protect him, it's to protect the agency. And so to hire an outside counsel contract where we're gonna spend money that the state has given us, that we have to go through a formal process. Part of that process has several steps to it. And the Attorney General acted as if, he, he didn't understand that process. Was, it, were all, was all of these conversations of these about wanting Penley to sign the contract so that Mr. Kamek could be an official employee on a mission for his outside counsel to investigate things, complaints brought by Mr. Paul? Well, actually what he wanted to do was Mr. Penley to sign the memo, which Mr. Penley is just one of the persons in the, in, in the chain of command. We'll, we'll get to that. So what do you, the, but was this a, a memo that would authorize the outside counsel contract for Mr. Kamek? It would, and eventually it would be actually the first assistant who would sign that contract under normal procedures. All right. So you mentioned earlier yesterday your, pro your process for different hirings and things like that. Would this have been a contract that had to go through about eight of you to be approved? I think that's correct. The memo would show that went and, through several layers. And at that time, what was your understanding as to where the approval rested at that time? How far down the chain or, or up the chain had it gotten? It, it had got, it stopped at Mr. Penley. Had it gotten to you at all? It had not gotten to me. Had you seen the contract? I had not. Did you know whether or not a contract had already been signed? Signed? No, I had no, no idea. No. Did you know that it was pending and had been approved by certain levels until it got to Mr. Penley. I mean, I, it would have had to have been approved before it got to Mr. Penley. All right. Now, when, it, when uh, you had this conversation with him, when it ended, how would you describe how, how, what the tone was? 
I mean, again, it, it was normal Ken Paxton. He asked for copies of our policies and procedures. Uh, and so I asked Lacey Mace, who is the deputy for administration, to gather those for him. And at the end of the day, we provided him to him. Actually, I think I gave it to his travel aide, Mr. Wicker, um, and, and gave them to, to General Paxton. Did, you have, did he, in that conversation, tell you what he wanted you to do with Mr. Pendley and Mr. Maxwell? I assumed in that conversation, no. I assumed that we were back to Penley and Maxwell involved, and, and certainly Penley involved in the investigation. The conversation on the 28th, at any time, did he ever take the position that he wanted you to fire Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell? Not in the morning meeting. All right. It, that was in later. Okay. You've referred now to a later. So did you have a second conversation on the 28th with Mr. Maxwell? I, excuse me, with Mr. Paxton? Yes, I did. And how, what was the occasion of that conversation? It was, I, my best guess is it was sometime after 9 p.m. because I was in my condo. And um, this was completely contrary to the, the morning's conversation. In what way? How was it different? It, this was the second time that uh, Attorney General Paxton was very upset, very angry. Did you form any opinion in your own mind in terms of how he was acting as to what was going on here? But I believed he had been, I believed he'd been drinking. All right. Did it sound like that to you? It, I mean, again, the best you can tell were the fun. It was so unlike any conversation I'd ever had with him. How would you characterize the conversation? I mean, he was angry. He was upset. I felt like perhaps there was someone else with him because he was literally saying the same things that we now had discussed two times before, repeating the same things, but in an agitated, I, I thought maybe he was recording the conversation. I mean, it was, it was a horrible, horrible feeling, especially for someone that... During that, how long did that conversation last? I mean, 10, 15 minutes. And in your situation, what was your response? I mean, I, I didn't, I was, I did not get angry with him. I was really confused. I was troubled because he kept pressing the same things over and over again. Um, and, and, and what were those things over and over again? It was, it all dealt with the hiring of Mr. Kamek. And what did it have to do with Mr. Pendley and Mr. Maxwell? Well, he, he. At one point in that conversation, he, he wants me to fire them, and, and, and he says he's reviewed the policies and procedures, and the first assistant can sign the contract. I want to ask you about that. So did he suggest, what did he suggest, if anything, about whether you could or should sign the contract? He suggested that I could and I should sign the contract. And what did you say? I said I would not sign the contract. You tell him why? I said it because I, I mean, I'm a rule of law guy. I believe in those, pol the, 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 those, those policies and procedures. And a schedule for that, if the contract would have been approved, if Mr. Pendley had approved, where would it go next? I think it goes up, and we'd have to look at the memo, but I think Ms. Mace has to approve it. Um, I think it then either goes up to either, either Missy or Ryan. It's a couple before it reaches me, but the memo would be the best. Would it have to work its way up to Mr. Bangert for sure before it got to you? I believe so. All right. At the end of the day, um, did he... Do you recall whether he ever said anything to you about Whether ask you a question about anything having to do with what if about him signing? Yeah, it, he asked a you know now in retrospect I think I understand why he asked it, but we had this discussion about the policies and the procedures again. This would have been at least the third time that we had it. He he urges me to sign it, and then at one point near the end of the conversation he asked me the question, well what if I've signed it? And I. What if he signs it? Yeah, he asked me. He asked me, "What if I signed it already?" Right. Um, what if I signed it, uh, Miss Manella? What if? What if? What if I signed it? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you would put that on there, it'd be the evening, the evening of the nine of um, 
9.28 in that conversation, he says to you, what if I had already signed it? What if I had already signed it? Yeah. And you're certain of that? Yes. All right. What'd you tell him? I told him that I would consider the contract void. Did he say to you he had already signed it? He did not say that. Now, how would, why would you consider a contract void if the attorney general signed it, even if you opposed it? Because the policies and procedures were in place in such a way to protect him and, and to protect the agency. If he had gone so far outside our policies and procedures on behalf of one person against the whole, against your whole staff, pursuing, pursuing a private matter using public resources, I mean, to me, that just, that, that, that has to be a void contract. Well, do you think he had the authority to sign a contract hiring Mr. Kamek? I, I think the attorney general has the authority to sign contracts. I will say, however, that the policies and procedures of the office, the attorney general did not sign many contracts. All right. Had you ever known him to sign one of these types of contracts before? Not an outside counsel contract. Right. But more to the point, do you think it was illegal under any circumstances for him to do it? Or did you think it was a violation of policy that had been running the department since you were there? Well, I thought it was wrong in this case, knowing everything I knew. That doesn't mean I don't believe the attorney general can't sign contracts. But I think it's Section non-responsive. He asked him whether it was legal for the attorney general to sign contract. We'd like to have an answer to that question. He's giving his answer. There's cross-examination for him to explore, in all due respect. Non-responsive, Your Honor. Sustained. Thank you. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, Your Honor, we'd like an answer to the question then. Is it legal for the attorney general to sign a contract? Oh. That was the question. You know, as much as I've made it this far in life without advice from Mr. Busby, I'm going to try to make it the rest of my life. I'll ask my questions, and if he objects, that's fine. I believe uh, you asked the question? Yes, I'll be glad to. I was in the process of trying to. Um, I believe you asked it. Let me look thank, at the transcript. Thank you very much. When do you... The, hold on one second. I'm sure. looking at the transcript. Sure. You ask the question, the witness can answer. Is it illegal for him to sign a contract? Now, uh, let me ask you this. Actually, he needs to answer the Counselor, question. Counselor, you asked the question. We've confirmed it on the transcript. Witness will answer the question. Thank you very much. Oh, can, you, can you restate it? Because if, if the question is, can the attorney general sign a contract, is that illegal? And that's what I understand the question to be. The, the, the Counselor, restate the question. You've asked it once. <laughs> I was restate back, the question. I, thank you. I, you I, I was looking back to see what I asked. It was line 21. <laughs> thank you. I think the question I, I, I see that I asked through all that exchange was, do you think it was illegal under, or was a violation of policy that it, or that had been running the department since you were there? But my question, let me try to break it down. Did you have an opinion that it Your was- Your Honor, I'm sorry to interrupt. Excuse me. I'd like the witness I've already, to answer the question. Me. I've withdrawn the question. I will proceed to the next with permission, oh. of course, of the court. You asked the question, the witness hasn't answered. We, we don't know what the question was anymore. I'm sorry. The Honor, he suggested that it's illegal for the Attorney General of the state of Texas to sign a contract. This witness knows it's not, and he should say so. And I have, I'll be glad to ask that question my way. I'll withdraw the question before, and if, with the court's permission, proceed.
You may withdraw the question. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, but I do want to proceed the topic, and that, that is, did you believe, or what was your belief, as to whether it was legally unlawful for him uh, to sign a contract and hire Mr. Paxson unilaterally, or did you think it was a violation of your policy? Just explain to us what your thought process was. And I believe you mean Mr. Kamek. Pardon me? You, I, you said mis hiring Mr. Paxton. Well, you I'm, glad, Mr. I'm glad you're, you're, you're following me. You're right. But that okay. correction, Mr. Paxton, back into the microphone so that both of us, yeah. here you go. What's your answer? So I believed at that time in that conversation with the Attorney General on the evening of, of September 28th that not only did signing that contract, if in fact the Attorney General had signed it, I believe that it violated our policies and procedures. But I also believed in the circumstances of Mr. Kamek, knowing everything that we knew, that it, that, that it, that it was unlawful. And why did you mean it? Why did you think it was unlawful in light of all the circumstances? Because Mr. Kamek was being hired to do something that I did not believe was in the interest of, 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 of the state. And, it, and that there wasn't a, I mean, the attorney general is not above the law. He has to comply with, with the law, like, like all of us. And so, I, the, again, knowing the whole circumstances at this point in time, that's what I believed. What was your opinion, one way or the other, as to whether if that signing of that contract was in pursuit of an unlawful purpose, was it, in your opinion, therefore unlawful? Correct. All right. Now, uh, and the purpose in this matter, were you aware of what your staff, needing Mr. Pendley and Mr. Maxwell, believed as to whether what they were being asked to do? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. We're going to hear from both Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Pendley. Was whether what they were being, do you have an opinion, or were you aware one way or the Pain. other as to what their position was? That's all I'm asking. Repeat that question. Thank you. Were you aware? at this time as to what position Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell had taken as to whether what they were being asked to do was unlawful. Your Honor, can we hear from Mr. Penley and Mr. Maxwell about their belief of this contract rather than hear him tell us what they told him? This is hearsay. I, I, I'm not asking for communication. Excuse me, I, I think she was talking. I apologize. Restate the question. Thank you. Were you aware at that time, uh, and we are in September of 28, uh, 928 of 2020, were you aware at that time, one way or the other, as to whether what Mr. Pendley and Mr. Maxwell's position was as to whether or not what the Attorney General and Mr. Paul were asking them to do was lawful. Just whether you were aware of what their opinion was. I'm not asking you if you were what it was. I object to that. He suggested Mr. Paul was somehow ha talking about this contract. There's no evidence of any of that. And, the, the, and therefore, the question is vague and assumes facts that certainly are not in evidence. You can ask the question, was he aware? That's all. Was he aware? and not what it was. I haven't asked him what it was. Can you answer? I was aware. All right. And did that have anything to do with your opinion as to what you were telling the Attorney General and how resistant you were to what he wanted to do? Yes, it did. By the way, that you yes, it did. Thank you very much. All right. Now, how did that conversation end? It ended abruptly. And, and then I want, to, uh, I want to try to move pretty quickly here through these, these last matters. That was Monday the 28th, was it not? Correct. Um, on Tuesday the 29th, uh, did you learn any new information that uh, concerned you greatly? Yeah, I was in a, a conference call, a Zoom meeting actually, involving 
all the chief deps across the country, a bipartisan meeting, we were dealing with opioids. And I got an urgent message, uh, first from my assistant and then from Ms. Mace, the deputy for admin, that there was an emergency. All right. And when you got up, what did you do when you got that call? Um, that I, message, excuse I, me. I, I excuse, I think I was leading the meeting uh, and I excused myself from the meeting uh, because Miss Mace and, and Ms. Hornsby wouldn't interrupt me unless it were really something important because they knew I was on an important call. What did you learn? I, I learned that, that a bank had called Miss Mace and informed her that Mr. Chan... Objection hearsay. All right. Stained. You don't need to tell what you did, but what did you, and as a result of the phone call, of the conference, did you talk to Ms. Mays or how did you find out? I talked to Ms. Mays. All right. And what were you concerned about then? I was concerned that someone was, that Mr. Kamek was um, saying that he was working for the Office of Attorney General and was engaged in activities. What kind of activities? He was serving subpoenas. On what banks. type of what type of subpoena? He was serving, seeking information from banks that appeared to be related to Mr. Paul and his activities. And were they the grand jury subpoenas? But they were grand jury subpoenas. Did you have any idea how or why he was obtaining grand jury subpoenas? Not on September 29th. All right. And and at that time, what did you do as a result of getting that information? I I debriefed with Miss Mays. Um, I believe at a certain point, Mr. Bangert, perhaps Mr. Brickman, and some of the other deputies were actually over here at the Capitol meeting with either the governor's office or the lieutenant governor's office. I don't, I don't remember. And, and so I, what, and what did you do as far as them? I called them back. All right. So when you called them back, where did you call them back to? Back to the eighth floor. And then was there a meeting? There was a meeting. And as best you remember, who all did you have in that meeting? I know it was Mr. Bangert, Miss Mays. And we're September the 29th? S September the 29th. Okay. Um, it was Mr. Bangert, uh, Ms. Mace, Mr. Penley. Um, Mr. Maxwell was out of town. Ms. Carey was out of town. Um, Mr. Vassar, Mr. Brickman. I may be missing someone, but I, that's the best of my recollection. And what was the purpose of this meeting? We were trying to figure out what was going on. What was your concern? Uh, my concern was we had somebody out there that wasn't part of our organization representing that he was a, a, an official with the attorney general's office. Now, did you have any idea at that time whether or not there was a, 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 a signed contract between Mr. Paxton uh, and Mr. Kampen? I, I, I had no idea. All right. Had you ever seen such a contract? I had, not at that time. Had you, everybody ever suggested to you there was such a signed contract? Not at that time. All right. Now, uh, what, can you describe sort of the atmosphere of this group? I mean, what, what's happening? I want you to try to describe it for me without going into what each person was saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it, we considered it sort of a crisis moment. I mean, everything regarding Mr. Paul was kind of coming to a head. And so at some point, Mr. McCarty joined. I don't think I'd mentioned Mr. McCarty. At some, and he wasn't in the original meeting, but eventually he joins. And so it's, it's really the first time that each of the deputies started to share, uh, and without getting into what they share, but started to share um, information, concern, each bits and pieces about Mr. Paul and his activities with the Attorney General. What is your testimony, uh, Mr. Mateer? as to whether or not, in many ways, people shared different things that you had never heard before. I mean, I learned things in that meeting that I hadn't known before. In terms of relationships with the Attorney General and Mr. P Mr. Paul? Correct. All right. Do uh, you have any explanation as to how you, the first assistant, would not know what all had been going on over the last nine months or so? I mean, I, you know, quite frankly, I beat myself up a little bit. I felt like I probably should have known more. But, you know, in, in my defense, we had a lot going on. And, and the way, I mean, we believed, and I, and I believe General Paxton believed, we believed in letting our leaders lead. 
And so they were each handling and, and, and managing their various divisions. And so I would only know what I'm told. Uh, and this was really the first time with everybody in a room together, folks began to share. Well, how, what would you, how would you describe in terms of their alarm one way or the other? Well, we were, it, it, I mean, we were, we were very serious. Um, I want to go back to a subject um, and you know that the allegations here, and all this has been public, about an affair that Mr. Paxton had um, with another person. Yes. Yes. When did you first, be before I go into questions about it, I want you to explain or express in your own way why that is relevant to the bigger picture of Mr. Paxton and Mr. Paul. Yeah. In your mind, if it is. No, it, unfortunately, it is relevant. Stay with the microphone, please. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, it is relevant. Um, during that week, the last week in the office, um, and I have to wind back, if I can, a little I'm, bit. I'm, I have to wind back a little bit, if, if I can, Mr. Hardin. I, I first became, I and other senior leadership in the Office of Attorney General became aware that um, Mr. Paxton was involved in an extramarital relationship sometime in 2016. And when? 2016. All right. Um, prior to, um, 2016, that's incorrect. It was, no, that, that, that is. And I'm then. Gonna, I got to get my, it was before his, re, I've got to think back to his reelection. It's, right. it's, it's his second, his first reelection. My question, my question is, did you become aware of it for the first time in 2018? 2018, that, that's when he was reelected. He was elected in 2014 the first time, 2018 the second time. So it would have been in the um, August, September time period of 2018 before his fall election. Um, How did you become aware? I think the first person I heard was someone in D.C. had actually mentioned it. Objection here, you, sir, Your Honor. And I'm yeah. also... Uh, this was a prime example of, of counsel suggesting the date to this witness. The witness, and this demonstrates Excuse the witness me, the way can't remember. Work, pardon me. The way this should work is simply state an objection. It is objection not to this is to hearsay. Thank you. Let me I, sustained. I, without. Thank you very much, Your Honor. So let's go back. Were you present at an occasion when Mr. Paxton confessed the affair to members of the staff? Yeah, mis, yes, Mr. Paxton. Mrs. Paxton, Senator Paxton, um, gathered senior staff from the Office of Attorney General and senior staff from the campaign. We had a meeting at the campaign office in which um, Mr. Mr. Paxton um, revealed that he had been engaged in an extramarital affair and asked for our forgiveness. And was it a very emotional, sympathetic meeting? It, it was. A very emotional meeting, right. yes. And at, that, that was with both Mr. and Senator Paxton, is that correct? They were both in attendance. Uh, yes. And at that, uh, would it have been a, 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 a general moment of sympathy for the whole event? Uh, absolutely. All right. After that, it, were there any assurances and so made by, by yeah. Mr. Paxton at that time? Yeah, I mean, Mr. Paxton apologized and in, in you know, using... Christian terminology, I would say he, he, you know, repented, and I know that's a Christian term, but from my perspective, that's, that's what I believed. And was uh, that really the tone and, and, and the way the whole encounter it, 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 went? It absolutely was, and, and you know, it, it, then we moved on, and obviously with the expectation that, that he, had, he had made a mistake, he had apologized, and, and we were moving on from it. When that meeting was over, did you, what was your assumption going forward as to whether that event was over, the main the affair? I mean, I assumed it was over because that's what he said. When did you first become aware that it was not over and how? It, that, without what somebody told you, was there any other personal, I'm only asking you for a time, dates or years that you became aware that it was not over? It, it wasn't until... Your Honor, this is... Unless Mr. Paxton told him something after that meeting, this is all based on rumor or hearsay. Sustained. Continue. In your own mind, did you ultimately believe 
that it had resumed. Again, that would be based on hearsay, and it's not relevant what he believed it's, about it, Mr. Paxton. State your objection. What is your objection? objection? Hearsay and relevance. Sustain. All right. Why did you think, if you believed the affair had resumed, that was relevant to your concern about the lieutenant, about uh, the attorney general and Mr. Paul? Because it answered one of the questions th that I kept struggling with is, why would General Paxton jeopardize all this great work that, that, that we had been doing at the, in, in the Office of Attorney General? Why would he be engaged in these activities on behalf of one person? I mean, all these different things. And, and by this time, we knew he had, he had, he had hired um, Mr. Kamek. Why, why would he do this against his advice of, of, of his, um, the people who he trusted to run his office, including me? And it answered that why question. Had you become aware by that time that uh, the woman he was having the affair with had been hired by Mr. Paul? I learned it that here, week. I'm sorry. Objection hearsay, Your Honor. Uh, overall, continue. thank you. I, I I learned that 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 that, miss, that this person had been hired by Mr. Paul that week. And why was that relevant to you? Because it answered the question: Why is he engaging in all these activities? And and it was like made on behalf of Mr. Paul. On behalf of Mr. Paul, why is he engaged in this? I mean, it seemed to me he was under undue influence. At one at times, I thought. Is he being blackmailed? I mean, this was so unlike what I experienced with him for four years. Like, and this was part of it. There may have been more, there may have been others, but this was certainly part of it. Mr. Mateer, did you ultimately resign? I did. When did you resign? I resigned on that Friday, October 2nd. And I believe we have asked before, let me make sure I'm right, you did not sue and you do not have any suit pending against either the Attorney General's office or Mr. Paxton or anyone out of this. Is that correct? I do not. If you go back to the things, what is your testimony as to whether you learned a lot more that gave you concern without going into what it was on the 29th as all, all of these deputies began to compare notes? What is your testimony as to and the very reluctant conclusion you came to. I mean, by that time, the 29th, because the next day is when we go to the FBI and DOJ. By that time, I, had inclu I, I, I concluded that you know, Mr. Paxton was engaged in, 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 in conduct that was immoral, unethical, and, and I had a good faith belief that, that it was illegal. What did you, what was your thought process as to what you would believe would happen if you did this? What did you believe might happen to you and the others if you did come forward? I mean, I knew by that time that my tenure as first assistant was, was, was coming to a quick end. So I knew that there would be, I mean, anytime someone stands up that there, that there could be consequences. So I knew I was in the process of, of leaving the office. You, of course, were not here and did not hear the opening statements in this case, did you? I did not. Let me ask you this. How long by the September the 29th and 30th had, by then, had you become aware that different members of the top level administrators in this department had in different ways been trying to stop the Attorney General for help on Mr. Paul. Objection leading. Sustain. Did you have a thought process in your own mind as to why you needed to go finally to law enforcement? I felt like we had been trying to protect Mr. Paxton. On several occasions, I'd gone to him and, and, and really my, I mean, he had become, I mean, he was my boss. He'd become a friend. Um, I cared for him. I cared for Senator Paxton. And I wanted him, 
I wanted him, I mean, I think in one of the memos I say, come clean. I mean, I wanted to help what? come clean. Microphone. Come clean. Yeah. I wanted to, I mean, my job, I feel one of the jobs of the first assistant is, is to protect, in addition to running the office, was to protect the, the attorney general. And, and quite frankly, I obviously failed at that. Um, and, but I came to the conclusion that Mr. Paul had enabled Mr. Paxton, and despite my efforts, the other deputies' efforts, we, we couldn't protect him because he didn't want to be protected. As you ultimately made your decisions, and as you have learned and things have happened soon, did you change your mind as to whether or not General Paxton was simply being blackmailed or something else? Did you ultimately make a conclusion of what you believed reluctantly about the conduct of the Attorney General. Yeah, again, I, can't, I, I re, in the end, I reached the inclusion that Mr. Paul enabled him to engage in the conduct that Mr. Paxton, Paxton engaged in. <clears throat> what is your opinion as to whether or not the level of responsibility the Attorney General had? I mean, ultimately, the Attorney General was responsible for his conduct. I'll pass the witness. We'll take a 10-minute break here. All right.